Yeah, anyway, I will do so. Okay, uh, the other day I was rather stunned when I saw something that Dr. Ann Belford Ulanoff said about Dr. Young's work. And this came up in uh, page 46 of this book, The Wisdom of the Psyche, by Ann Belford Ulanoff. And, and what she said there is uh, rather startling to me after many years of uh, reading Dr. Jung and several times reading Dr. Ulanoff. So uh, let me just read the sentence that shocked me. Uh, she said, Jung fell for the devil's trick, I think, and missed the sophisticated psychological description of the privatio boni gives us of evil's reality. And this is very significant because in Ion, one of Dr. Jung's major works and major controversial works, uh, there are a couple of chapters that are dedicated to the issue of privatio boni, and especially the idea of um, God containing both good and evil. And so there are two books, actually, that Dr. Olenhoff wrote. The first one was this one, uh, The Wisdom of the Psyche. The second one is this one, The Living God and Our Living Psyche. And she addresses this issue in both books, about, written about 20 years apart. But by the second book, she seems to have softened a little bit. <laughs> and and uh, so um, it comes down to what I think what in the law we would call a distinction without a difference. But um, I'll leave it to you to decide. Uh, so anyway, uh, good morning, Art. Welcome. Um, all right. So I'm going to be lit reading from the middle of her second chapter of this book, The Wisdom of the Psyche. And that chapter is entitled uh, The Devil's Trick. But I'm going to read only um, from part two of that chapter. The devil loves to trick us away from the real cross to the false one. He offers with particular skill in the late 20th century, in the time of existentialist rhetoric, the lure of nothingness, to make something into nothing and nothing into something. The woman who glowed with new consciousness of being valued for herself was tempted to make it nothing by not knowing about it, by not keeping it in consciousness. The dreamer was tempted to get stuck in arguing the case either for or against a position about homosexuality and losing sight of the real connection between parent and child. Jung attacked the Christian notion of evil as the privation of good, as a making of nothing out of something of evil. Evil is real, Jung argued, not a privation. He felt the traditional idea dangerously tempted us to deny the reality of our own shadows and of evil itself. Jung fell for the devil's trick, I think, and missed, the, and missed the sophisticated psychological description the privatio boni gives us of evil's reality. For what is evil, after all? What is its reality? It is a real force of nothingness that pulls us away from the being that is there, available and accessible, that we can claim as we swirl toward emptiness, disintegration, blockage, obstruction. Evil spins us away from the center, dissolving our perception of it, 
breaking into pieces our experience of it, luring us to place more and more parts in front of ourselves so that we can move away from being present and open to the real self we are given to be. We take being tired, being busy, being caught by our jobs as ways of keeping from contemplating the good that there is. We put second, third, eighth, fiftieth, fiftieth things first in place of putting first things first. Evil makes absence where there is evil makes absence where there was presence, makes nothing where there was something. It spins us into the void, into disintegration, into envy and resentment. As Barth says, quote, when I speak of das Nichtig, I, I can't pronounce that word, but I think he's, uh, the translation might be the nothingness. When I speak of das Nichtig, I cannot mean that evil is nothing, that it goes not, that it does not exist, or that it was no reality. Evil is all too real a force a driving force that precedes deprivation, a force that cuts things off at the roots so nothing can grow. So many events of our history and our present world make this all too clear in ways that break the heart. The terrible suffering comes to mind of those Japanese schoolgirls who, looking skyward into the amazing flash of the exploding atomic bomb, had their eyelids permanently burnt off from its heat. Children can be born to parents who do not or cannot love them, who may torture them psychologically or physically, leaving them crippled for life. People can be born into a land of dust, knowing from the first breath of consciousness to the last moment before they die, the assault of dirty air and sterile earth, of constant hun hunger, of constant hunger for better things, ordinary better things. Worse still, such scarring, such torturing, such starving could be ameliorated, if not cured, but it is not because of red tape, political infighting, financial dealing, and all the small mean-spirited, and all the small mean-spiritedness we inflict upon each other. Evil is the stopping up of love, the withholding of warm response, the petty malice that amasses more and more rage and hate so that it breaks out in savage acts of rape and murder. Yes, evil is all too real. Evil is that dark hole within us where we turn away from good and may fall into the abyss itself. What Jung was after, I believe, is the psychological and religious truth that we must admit to ourselves just how strong evil is, just how strong evil is. It is not something we can get around or ignore. What he missed, I believe, is the greater theological truth that good is stronger than evil and of a different order of being. Created being is good. The being we are given is held in the circle of relationship of creator and creature. Evil is the force that makes us deny the relationship and seek to break it. Claiming both kinds of truth, psychological and theological, we do not fall for the devil's trick. We trick the trickster by knowing just how powerful evil is, and also knowing that it is not as powerful as good, not of the same order of being. The devil's trick is out-tricked by our effort to claim the evil that vitiates us individually and communally, that would make nothing of the good given us, that would destroy our vision of the good and turn us away from the radiating presence of good to the absenting forces of evil. Now, what I would observe here is that Dr. Jung never said anything about the metaphysical God. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, so, but he was talking about psychology and he was st stuck on looking at a psychological, scientific approach to these issues. And so what Dr. Ulanoff's point is here is that we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. There are both theological and psychological aspects of this. So um, anyway, I'm not going to go into your comments and such uh, just yet because I, uh, I'm afraid that um, this is a bit of a long reading and I will do my best to get to them at, to them at the end. And so I'm reading right now from The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belfort Ulanoff. It was first published in 1988 and republished in 2000. <clears throat> Take this example of a woman's dream that gave her an unforgettable image of what assaulted her in her life as evil. Quote, a huge dog jumps up on me and puts its enormous paws around my face. It wraps its front legs around me and it goes for me. Finally, it puts its great teeth around my eyes. I wake up in terror." Unquote. She falls right back to sleep and dreams again. This time she feels of what to her is an image and vision of the good. Quote, God comes down. God comes down a, a staircase. God comes down a staircase in a house. It has been a long time since we've seen her. God is a she. Yet, when she gets downstairs to where we live, she is not God, but rather the one who loves God. She is ordinary looking. She is a bit dumpy. She is middle-aged, but she is the one who loves God. There is a sense that this is the real thing, unquote. We must look closely at these two dreams. In the first, the pawing, mauling dog with its great teeth threatening her eyes, her consciousness, is her homegrown image of instinctual aggression gone unheeded, of potential destruction that she dare not deny or it will savage her. She cannot just knuckle under and be a good little girl, or the dog will control her through her fear of it. She must wrestle to, she must wrestle to house the dog, to house this aggressiveness as if it were a dog she had to tame and train and leash, but always recognizing it as other as not entirely domesticated or harnessed to conscious purpose. Its bigness and its particular animal state as a dog link it symbolically to the wild, dark, Hecate goddess of the underworld. Such an archetypal reality can never be completely summed up and put in place by conscious intention. The dream task is to house this energy to make a space in consciousness for it, not to own it, to possess it or gut it. If she does not struggle to house it, where will the dog go? Out on the neighbor's lawn or worse, onto the neighbor's children or to strike at the neighbor's eyes. The images that are alive in us do not just go away if we neglect them, they go unconscious. In the unconscious, they accumulate more and more force and regress to more and more archaic forms. And the more they are denied the intercession of the ego. The ego's ministry is to pay attention to such images, to make space for them in consciousness. This, that allows such images to be modified by contact with reality. Then we can use this aggressive energy, whether in the world or to sustain a further reach into the unconscious. 
I'll just interrupt for a moment to mention a couple of things. One is that the first chapter of this book is called The Ministry of the Ego, and that's a very important idea because as Dr. Jung talked about bringing things into consciousness, then we in our consciousness have to make decisions, moral decisions. And so I'm reading from The Wisdom of the Psyche by Ann Belford Ulanoff, and Dr. Ulanoff is Emerita Professor of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary. Social oppression is also, I'm sorry, let me re start that over again. Social oppression is always fueled by the psychological repression of what we do not struggle to house. What we repress poisons the psychological and spiritual atmosphere like acid rain. What we repress pollutes the genuine feelings and thoughts we do express by intruding into them a hidden motive, hidden, be, hidden even from ourselves, that twists what we say and mean to, alter, to ulterior purposes that twists what we say and mean to ulterior purposes. What we repress amasses energy in our unconscious like a private weapons arsenal and explodes into the world when, whether through a sniper's bullet, a burst of unrestrained anger out of proportion to its cause or a gust of emotion and inflates a small spark of controversy into uncontrollable size. I'll read that sentence once again. What we repress amasses energy in our unconscious like a private weapons arsenal and explodes into the world, whether through a sniper's bullet, a burst of unrestrained anger out of proportion to its cause, or a gust of emotion that inflates a small spark of controversy into uncontrollable size. What we repress will eventually join together with what others repress, as together we seek a scapegoat to unload itself upon. Sooner or later, if we do not deal with the untamed dog, we will select a group onto whom the dog will be loosed. In fact, we might even feel justified at unleashing our dog on this other group. The evil we neglect to admit and fail to house will amass its strengths, attack, accuse, and seek to make nothing of the connections we hold to be so important in our lives. Um, toward the end of this reading, if there's time, I will go back and talk about how uh, these things are connected to some actions in our society today. We must also account for the next image from the same night's dreams of God who comes down. Yet when down, it is not God, but she who loves God. There is a pleasing ambiguity here. She who loves God is the one who loves by living in her house, seeing what passes through it, containing what she can and making space for what is untenable, uncontainable. Is the one who loves God an ordinary woman called to house the extraordinary presence of God? Is she God in herself or the lover of God? These are the images the psyche puts to the dreamer to wrestle with. That is precisely what Jung reminded us to do, to take seriously what our particular wrestling with God requires of us. My own thought about Jung is that he had no place to put the bad, so he put it in God and wrestled with it there, saying God possessed a dark side. In psychoanalytical terms, in psychoanalytic terms, we could hazard the interpretation that Jung struggled to reach what meta 
that Jung struggled to reach what Melanie Klein called the depressive position, that sorrowful yet bracing realization that bad and good are mixed through all of life. In ourselves, in those we love and esteem, in those upon whom we are dependent. No moral state exists in such simple purity, only in confusing ambiguity. If as if it is as if Jung could not see how we could it is as if Jung could not see how we could house those opposites of love and hate within us. So he saw God housing them, struggling with them, and needing our help to do so. For some of us, the problem is just the reverse. We cannot house the good, so we put it all into God and make a fixed, idealized God, meanwhile, feeling only too alien feeling only too alienated, fragmented, and sinful in ourselves, missing the great joy of faith. We must struggle to house both the good and the bad. That is the ministry of the ego. And once again, I'll remind you that uh, this phrase, the ministry of the ego, is the name of the first chapter of this book, The Wisdom of the Psyche. Okay, so I'll read that sentence again. We must struggle to house both the bad and the good. That is the ministry of the ego. The particular images through which this task is handed to us that frame our particular questions are the, that frame our particular questions are the same kinds of images and questions asked in the large of all humanity. How can there be evil and a good God. What can, be, what can we do with the reality of evil? When we try to admit and house evil in ourselves, it does not get all neatened and straightened up, explained away. Rather, we are opened to the mystery of evil. We step in line with Jung behind Job with our questions, with his questions in hand. We step in line behind Job, who steps in line behind Cain and Abel. Why is life like this? Why do the innocent suffer? In terms of Cain and Abel, why is one gift accepted and the other refused? Even though one son was clearly accepted, he fared no better than the son who was rejected. He was murdered, after all, as Jesus was later to be crucified. Cain, the son whose offering Yahweh rejected, was cursed, thrown into alienation, a homeless, rootless state. Who is this Yahweh who does not deal fairly with the first two brothers, a God whose account both suffer? The temptation, the devil's trick, leads us from the mystery of Yahweh who does not conform to our rules of fairness our conceptions of what God ought to be like, but confounds them. The trick would lead us from the puzzlement and pain of Yahweh's mysterious rejection and equally mysterious acceptance. The devil's, the devil's trick tempts us to avoid the stark otherness of the transcendent. One who simply does not fit into our understanding of fair play as he drives us away from our terror before this unknown, this untamed God. Instead of feeling the wound of heart and soul, we, like Cain, fasten on envy of our brother, as if Abel were the origin of the problem. Then we put our revenge or our solution in the center place, pinning ourselves to a false cross. The real cross in that situation is to suffer the shocking hurt and confounding of our rules of justice, to keep our eye on Yahweh. Who is this that accepts me, but I know not why? Who is this that refuses what I bring, but I know not why? The real cross is to stay wrestling there, in that gap between our images of God 
and God's self-disclosure. The false cross defrauds us of that vision and lures us to accuse our neighbors as Cain accused Abel, saying, it is your fault, you must pay. Job held on right in that crucible of the immediate experience of Yahweh. He held on past the explanations of his friends who tried to fit him to the rules, saying clearly he suffered because he broke the rules. Job was pushed Job was pushed past all standards of fairness, past all that was known and imagined about God's justice. He was pushed to join with the suffering of the innocent, like those children slaughtered at Christ's birth when it is said, like those children slaughtered at Christ's birth when it is said, Christ lost his own innocence. It is not insignificant that at the end of the tale, Job becomes the intercessor for just these friends because he was grounded in more immediate experience of Yahweh and thus open to Yahweh's self-revelation. Job kept his eye on Yahweh simply by taking his image of the Lord seriously. Job stands for all of us in doing Job stands for all of us in doing that and for the best of our human images of God. For Job believed in the God of ethical monotheism. For Job believed in the God of ethical monotheism, in whom justice forms the core. By holding to this image of God, he went straight into the darkness of the questions that Cain shirked. Why does God reject me? Why does God make me suffer? By holding on to this image of God, which represented the best of our human concerns, Job exposed the bankruptcy of all our human versions, visions, and images of God. As Paul Ricoeur puts it, quote, Job bears witness to the irreducibility of the evil of scandal to the evil of fault, unquote. It cannot be explained. Come to the end of the ladder of human images for God, Job. Sorry. Coming to the end of the ladder of human images for God, Job sees the gap between them and the transcendent one. Job moves to give up the narcissism of his particular point of view to make a leap to something bigger. Yahweh shows him the way of a transcendent God who is not distant now, but speaks directly to Job, addressing questions to him, taking him seriously enough to show him something of divine reality. Thus is Job given an immediate experience of a present God who surpasses all previous human understanding of God. The answer to Job is a constantly more accessible God who comes right to us, who speaks in his own person, who reaches us in love. This God is not a plan of consciousness, not a new mental health scheme, not a political solution, nothing abstract or generalized, but a person. Where where are we left then? Right there in the gap between our images of God and God's self-disclosure. Like Job, our images of God are lifelines to our psyches, enabling us to hold on in the midst of confusion, of perplexity, and of suffering, to catch our meaning in a net full of great holes, the great rents in the fabric of our individual and shared being. With these lifelines, we do not just plunge through the gap into meaninglessness, but as we hold on to our images, to those experiences that have marked us, we are brought to the edge of the unknown. Then we break off, even break down. They cannot reach across. They cannot cover the abyss of unknowing where God may come to speak to us, to be with us, even appear to us. 
we are left then living very near this gap, sometimes even falling into it. The burden of the Christian, and of the clergy in particular, is to struggle right there in the gap, where all where all our knowledge moves into unknowing. We must not deny that mystery, nor indulge in the fiction that the perfect theory would clear it all up, would make it all calm by closing the gap between us and God. When we do that, we are no better than Cain. We have taken our eye off Yahweh to pounce on our neighbor to explain why misfortune afflicts the world. The ministry of the ego and the ministry of the church, understood as the ego of Christendom. Okay, let me just clarify. So she's referring to the ministry of the church as the ego of Christendom. Okay, so I'll start that paragraph again. <clears throat> The ministry of the ego and the ministry of the church, understood as the ego of Christendom, is to get a house for this struggle, to see the reality of evil, to know beyond doubt that it is different from the reality of good. We cannot accomplish either the housing or the moral certainty of the good unless we do both. We need to claim the good in order to house the evil. Otherwise, we will be overtaken by evil, burnt out, burnt up. The devil's trick is to divert us from this ego task by frightening us with large abstract evils so that we let go of the little devils that live in us. And so we are seduced to forget our petty evils which are our own specific and concrete ego tasks to meet. We see ourselves not only participating in the great production, quote, evil and the universe, unquote, but starring in it. Christians have a lot to answer for here, I believe. We are too easily tricked in this way, hearing and saying in words always addressed to us, Ah, it's selfish to do that, it's bourgeois, it's individualistic, part of the decadence of the West to think about these little problems, a petty elitism, unquote. We should be working to change the world, we should be helping in all the great causes, making a brave new world come about quickly, but too often, what we do in the service of the great causes is to join Job's friends, moralizing about evil, making evil, tidy, I'm sorry, making easy, tidy explanations, saying to all around us, if only you had the right political, social, historic, economic understanding, the right connection of the, uh, the right connection to the unconscious, or the right kind of piety, the right side in a word, then none of this would be happening to you or your country or the world. No big dog would be leaping to savage you. Meanwhile, your own dog with its great paws is joining the pack. We feel ourselves justified in letting it loose on the enemy and more than, just, and more than justified, required to do so. Housing evil means not being fobbed off by the devil's trick into grabbing for the utopian solution. We are painfully aware of the powers of destruction, the violence leaping up in countries all over the world. The devil tricks us to collaborate with him by looking to solve everything cleanly, quickly, altogether forgetting the Christian wisdom that reminds us that we are flawed, imperfect, always fallible, not perfectible. The opposite temptation, also the devil's trick, is then to withdraw and do nothing, often under the guise of seeking a spiritual life, but an unfleshed spiritual life, removed from the ambiguities, stresses, and surprises of living is an ersatz life. Spirit in the flesh is the Christian's secret. 
wrestling with the realities of power, money, conflict, finite limits, and finite possibilities. Solving evil or withdrawing from it leads to dead ends. Neither root houses the evil we can identify and do something about. One denies it, and in denying it, it becomes it. The other resigns to it, and thus also becomes it. The alternative is to grasp and to claim the good, not the utopian good, but the good enough good, which is tough, small, concrete, real. It means recognizing that order always comes out of disorder. The order that would put an end to disorder is the most frightening disorder of all, because freedom always means mess. Just as we cannot house evil if we do not claim the good, we cannot claim and build up the good if we do not see the evil that besieges us. Evil displays a different order of being from the goods. Evil destroying being. Good builds being. It is psychologically and politically sound that our it is it is psychologically and politically sound that our response to evil, besides the struggle to house it, is to build up the good against it. The evil tries to trick us into not doing that, but instead to become so fascinated with toe-to-toe -to -toe combat with evil that everything else disappears. We fight evil best by becoming totally involved in exploring the reality of the good, which is real being. How do we do that? How do we claim the good and build it up? I go back again to the concrete and the small in the example of a woman's dream to which she gave a name. She called it her theological dream. She called it her theological dream. It is very short. Quote, I am placed at the goodness table, not the safety table where my friend is placed, nor the badness table. There is no food at the bad, there is no food at the badness table, and there is no one there. Unquote. End of dream. The dreamer says about the woman placed at the safety table that she definitely represents a part of herself that always seeks approval, always tries to find a politically expedient solution that won't ruffle or make waves. She knew how strong her own pull was toward the safety of gaining others' approval. But the dreamer also saw this other woman as one who sought power, if not in a political situation, at least over herself. The dreamer never liked that power-seeking behavior in her friend. The dream made her understand such motives in herself and also see that her friend's self-aggrandizing may have sprung from her wanting always to be safe. The dreamer was shocked to find that she herself was placed at the goodness table. She would have put herself at the badness table because she was forever fretting over her inferiorities, her lapses, her faults. It was a penance and a discipline for her to be seated at the goodness table. What struck her even more strongly was that nothing, no thing, no food, no one sat at the badness table. She felt that that was the truth about evil. No thing is there in place of something. No nourishment is offered there. In contrast, her task was to sit at the goodness table and eat. That was her penance. Through this dream, perhaps we can all learn that the devil's trick is to get us not to sit at the goodness table. To sit at the goodness table would mean not being afraid to say to sit at the goodness table would mean not being afraid to say we have made a right decision, even though it was not a perfect one. It might it might mean not denying that our intention toward another was good, 
even though self-serving motives were also involved. It might mean admit it might mean admitting that our intention as a nation is to harbor freedom, to give bountifully to our neighbors around the world, even though our even though there are self-serving actions and all sorts of dubious procedures and politics mixed up in this giving. If we cannot claim the good as it lives in us, we have no house in which to tame the beast as it leaps up in us. We only tear down our own house, join our own detractors, desert the good, leave it homeless and orphan. What good exists in us goes begging, altogether neglected. We fear this view of claiming the good. We think it leads to inflation, pomp, and self-preening. In the church, too, we can be too quick to point the accusing finger and to slow and to slow to hold and too slow to hold and too slow to hold out the good bits that glow that glow there in our traditions and give not just solace and comfort for suffering but the glad joy the amazement at finding diamond hard truths sorry but the glad joy the amazement at finding diamond hard truths there available to us for the asking Claiming the good means feeling and acknowledging the joy of the good. It means knowing that a dreamer can spot the trick in his dream and get the right issue, seeing that a person in analysis can feel so cared about. Claiming the good means that people like ourselves do get up week after week and talk about the transcendent God who comes down into our midst it means that we can dream of a God with all that pleasing ambiguity. Is she God? Is God? Can God be a she? Is it she who loves God or is it God who loves her? It is good that the psyche gives us such images. It is good that we are given such dreadful freedom to keep our eye on a God who confounds all our images of God. It is good that there are clergy who throw sorry. It is good that there are clergy who throw out all the liturgical year. Pray pray for each member of their congregation, expanding their soul's space. Sorry. Obviously, this gets me very deeply. It is good that there are clergy who throughout all the liturgical year pray for each member of their congregation, expanding their soul space in the rush of life, so that when they go into their churches, they can smell that these are churches So that when they go into their church, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so that when they go into their churches, they can smell that these are churches. That they can smell that these are churches that have been prayed in. such a church that is the chapel at the U.S. Naval Academy that is just such a church. We know all these moments, we all, 
We all know these moments of goodness. They are little, they are big, like the smell of fresh bread or the soothing wetness of water on the skin. They are in fact that a woman they are the fact that a woman diagnosed as terminally ill finds suddenly settled in her a lifelong besetting fear. This, libera this liberation allows her in the midst of great suffering afflicting her to step gladly into moments of ease and joy. After a dozen years of struggle, she can give herself wholeheartedly to her love for her husband. Under the shadow of death, she finds unexpected... Under the shadow of death, she finds unexpectedly a glowing life of life-giving love under the nurturing wing of goodness. And all these small and large miracles happen in the midst of filth, in the midst of malice, bombings, murders, and every sort of petty meanness. Building up the good means not letting go of these bits and not refusing them, even though they do not put an end to murder or meanness or malice, but ourselves taking up our assignment at the goodness, but ourselves taking up our assignment at the goodness table and gladly. We are reluctant to do that because goodness asks things of us, makes its firm claims in turn. Goodness makes the special claim on us of asserting its claims in and through the self we are given by being fully present to that self, including its evil, its pettiness, its special failures and fallibilities. We need to be fearfully realistic about evil but that does not mean that we are to be endlessly fearful. Goodness says, claim me in yourself, in others, as I show myself in the world. Do not put up endless fronts to place. Do not put up endless fronts in place of my being in you, playing parts instead of being present. We evade this true self the way we evade contemplating the infinite. We are too busy, too tired, too preoccupied with the method of arrival ever to give attention to what awaits us there. Thus, in prayer, we empty and block at the same time. Claiming the good means just that, taking it, letting ourselves receive, receive it and giving it back. Goodness demands that we take it, accept it, receive it. This means making room for it, being stripped of whatever gets in its way. This is the familiar stage of purgation that we all know about. We must clean house and discover the second, third, fifth, eighth things we have put in the place of this first thing. We must confess that we have turned away, acting as if this bit of goodness had not come to us. We must face the fact that we have perjured the truth that has shown itself to us, living as it were false. Goodness radiates all the force of created being, burning, actualizing, illuminating. We need to confess the evil we do, and that is done to us. All those, all those pulls away from illumination into opaqueness into fogging over, whirling away into mist, far from the center, not caring for it, not daring it. Confessing our failure to house the good and build it, confessing our failure to house the good and build it up makes us feel how thoroughly bad is mixed up in all our good motives and makes us in the best sense penitent. It makes us see how even in the evil that is done to us, we veer off course away from the good, sinking into our suffering at the hands of others, overcome by bitterness, resentful, overcome by bitterness, resentment, and misery. Yet we can still feel rising in us the impulse to make amends, to repair the hurt, to come again to a willing 
attentiveness, and joyful excitement that in itself is a bit of good in the midst of pain and suffering. Claiming the good means recognizing its pull, its impulse in us to take it in hand and give what belongs to it back to it by our desire to make things better. We know about these gestures and we are glad to know what we know, the bad and the good. Now I'm going to stop there, but I wanted to, um, yeah, at least I'm going to stop there in this book, but I'm going to uh, refer back in a moment, just a second. <laughs> Let me uh, just go back to one thing that uh, Dr. Olinoff uh, referenced, which was uh, the issue of homosexuality. And um, her point is that the debate over homosexuality is not the point. The point is the relationship between the parent and the child. And um, you know, obviously, uh, the parent bringing a child into the world and raising that child is a numinous thing. It's a, it's something good, and if you lose sight of that goodness by simply bickering over the validity or or the issue of homosexuality in society. Uh, you lose the good in the process. Um, now I want to go back, um, and uh, now I want to read from uh, The Living God and Our Living Psyche, what Christians can learn from Carl Jung. And I just want to go um, again to this specific issue about the privatio boni, and then I'll discuss it a little bit more. So I'm on page 64 of this book, and the title of the chapter in which it appears is Where to Put the Bad, Where to Put the Bad, Where to Put the Feminine. And so here's what Dr. Olinoff says. Christian church, I'm sorry, Christian tradition asserts that it is as if God says, quote, yes, I take responsibility for creating you as free creatures who can choose to refuse me. I climb on the cross and become there, not just the God who unconditionally loves you and forgives and accepts you, but also the God who takes your worst. I suffer the consequences of your sin, just as does the innocent bystander." Unquote. Walter Lowe thinks that God's forbidding our eating from the tree of life is not so much an interdiction as it is a creative limit. In psychological jargon, we would call it a frame, a container for innocence and freedom that allows human and divine to coexist and not consider and not cancel each other out. Confession, when done freely from the heart, clears a space like that of innocence again where God's freedom and ours meet. We turn and are turned again to live from the source, the origin point we symbolize with our pictures for God. For Jung, For Jung, the privatio boni means that evil does not exist with the same force as does good, and therefore we can get around it because it is insubstantial. Thus, we can deny our shadow because it is not really real. I disagree. I find the privatio boni a sophisticated idea, both psychologically and theologically. Evil does exist as an existential force, real, effective, but it does not exist as does good. It exists as making absence where there is presence, as a howling mood of resentment, unbudging in the face of anyone's attempt to reach us, as a refusal to recognize the presence of this person in front of us as a person. It demotes 
subtracts, abstracts, chooses void over substance, goneness over being here, now facing the task. Goneness over being here now, facing the task. We all know the dangerous passage in successful clinical work where the person is no longer caught by an addiction or compulsion or despondent depression. Now there is a tiny but clear bit of elbow room. They see it, no alternatives, can fight it, can choose otherwise. At this moment, every clinician is completely dependent on his or her clients. Which way will they choose? We cannot choose for them, but only wait in hope. Related to this issue of evil as the sin of turning away from primary relationship from the center of all life and the refusal of exercise that and the refusal to exercise that tiny bit of elbow room is Jung's notion of God, not as summum bonum, but as I said earlier, the bundle of opposites, the complexio oppositorum that needs our devoted service in struggling to transform them into a wholeness, both in ourselves and in God. Such struggle amounts to our contribution toward God, becoming the conjunction of opposites, the conjunctio oppositorum. For Christians, God is good, not a mixture of good and evil. Here is a picture of a God who enters into human suffering, who is in Christ takes on himself, who in Christ takes on himself the agonies, sorrows, and griefs of humans overcome by sin and captured by the principalities and powers of evil. What the Son suffers, the Father suffers, for they are of the same substance. So the heart of reality abides in our hearts, so afflicted by suffering. God's engagement with us in our worst captivity is an act of choice, moved by compassion. We who are captives cannot see the graciousness of God, but picture God as punitive, distant, impassable, vengeful. What distinguishes God from us is precisely this compassion to take into the Godhead the worst we can do and to still abide with us and for us. The creative limit, which, as Paul Ricoeur says, does not repress but orients and guards freedom. We see only as prohibit, we see only as prohibition or empty alternative. In Jesus, we see the alternative of choosing the tree of life fulfilled Evil does not go away. Indeed, it afflicts him from his birth in poverty and filth to his parents' flight for his life when he was just a few days old, to his being the catalyst for massacre of other infants, and on and on into the mounting of the cross. That other tree that reveals an abyss of love that is stronger than the abyss of death. I like Lady Julian's words that sum up how to see good and evil and God. She says, quote, God authors all good and suffers all evil, unquote. Okay, so that is the end of what I wanted to read today, and I managed to do it in one hour. Uh, now I will go back and take a look at um, some of your comments here. And then uh, what I propose to do is to um, put some of the things that Dr. Olinoff said in the context of modern American politics. And I know that um, many have said to me uh, that I should not discuss politics in this Jungian channel. However, um, I believe that we do have to take sides between good and evil. 
and um, so therefore I will be taking sides if my taking of sides um, will offend you um, please uh, discontinue watching at this point uh, because I'm going to do it whether you like it or not <laughs> so we have a lot of comments here let me go back <laughs> Ray Yates says, Sophia bombs before noon. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Sophia is wisdom in the Old Testament. Uh, Aurora says, sorry I'm late, Skip, but can I ask what book you're reading from? Okay, so I have read from two books. The first is The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belford Ulanoff, and the second is the living God and our living psyche, what Christians can learn from Carl Jung. Um, and um, that's by Anne Belford Ulanoff and Alvin Doig. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay. So all Freud's theories are true, but they are true for Jews, not for Europeans, says Clark Kent. Uh, well, all Freud's theories are true if you're a materialist. And what uh, Dr. Jung said quite explicitly, um, in it may have been in his uh, eulogy of Dr. Freud, but it was anyway observing of Dr. Freud that if Freud had not gone off on materialism, um, then he would, um, then Jung would still be with him. Um, and so their split had nothing to do between, the, about the difference between uh, Freud being a Jew and, and Jung a Protestant. It had to do with the fact that Dr. Freud insisted on materialism, which you could think of as the logos. And Dr. Jung's point is that you also have to have the eros. You have to put life into concepts. And, um, and so that was a fundamental idea. And as Leonardo da Vinci said, he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. And uh, Dr. Jung's belief basically was that um, Freud was talking about concepts in, very, in a very rigid way and not um, drinking from the fountain itself. And so Mr. Krishnamurti says, over 3,000 were killed here in Guatemala a couple months ago innocent people in villages would a right and mighty god allow this i think not where is he okay well mr krishnamurti this is the um, standard excuse of um, i guess atheist would be the way to put it um, and um, that's not the way that god works uh, God works in um, a very bloody way, a violent way, in, in a way uh, which involves all humanity. And the death of 3,000 innocents also relates to uh, the evil of trying to have troops at our border uh, to prevent people trying to escape that. Uh, from coming into the United States and the answer is more in my belief that uh, we should be helping people in Guatemala um, live a peaceful and meaningful life where they are from rather than um, trying to fight off the people who are trying to escape tragedy like that and it takes the death of thousands in order to get the attention 
of others. I mean, this is the point that Dr. Jung made about World War I, that it took the death of 8 million people before, or 8 million soldiers, not people, because many more people were killed. But it took the blood of a generation of Europeans to uh, put a stop to the carnage. And then what happened was that the Western powers wanted to be punitive on the Germans, and uh, they were in the Treaty of Versailles, and therefore Adolf Hitler was able to use that vengefulness of the Western powers as um, an excuse for building up for World War II. And um, that's very sad, but true. Um, I'm just going to test the sound here. Okay, I guess it looks all right. Uh, um, and, um, and so what happened then is we got 50 million more people killed in World War II. And after World War II, what did we do? We put in place... Um, a more compassionate approach, which was the Marshall Plan, both in Japan and in Germany and Italy and in Western Europe generally. And the result of that was that we had uh, several generations of peace. I'm not sure that we have enough wisdom to keep that peace, but in any case, um, uh, in Japan, I was the beneficiary of that because, um, and uh, let me, I'll give you an example. When I was 15 years old, um, in 1962, um, I was um, traveling on, or trying to travel on a train in Japan and uh, it was late at night, I was alone, and I was going back to my home, which was in the ancient capital of Japan, Kamakura, uh, which is the location of the great Buddha that you may be familiar with. And um, it was late at night, I had only been in Japan about six or eight weeks at that point, and, <clears throat> but I, um, knew enough to take the train. And unfortunately, I was on the train platform in Yokohama Station, and I did not realize that that platform used more than one train and or more than one routing, and I could not read Japanese. And so the result was that um, I got on a express train going in the wrong direction and um, the train went for two hours and I arrived at the first stop, the first time the train stopped, uh, at a very, very dark train platform uh, and I had no idea where I was. There was one light bulb on the platform and I had in my mind that I would simply take the next train back uh, to Yokohama and get myself more back to some place I knew. And, um, and so there was a trainman on the platform and I said to him, you know, when's the next train back? I pointed at my watch and so on. And he says, no, no, Awadi, Awadi, it's finished. That means finished for tonight. And so I knew that I would have to be there for many hours on this dark train platform. And the trainman left the platform. So I was totally alone, 15 years old. Um, and um, fortunately, a taxi cab uh, came by the platform looking for passengers, and of course he didn't expect to see a 15-year-old American and probably didn't see me as that in the dark. And so he uh, 
accepted me to get into his cab, and I told him I wanted to go to Kamakura, and he was uh, he was very shocked, but he did it, and uh, we got back to my house at 4.30 in the morning, and my father had spent all of his yen, uh, except for 400 yen, and the fee at that time, which was very cheap for us as Americans, uh, was 1350 yen. And so the taxi driver ultimately accepted uh, 400 yen, a carton of cigarettes, and um, five dollars worth of military payment certificates. I think my... Sorry. Okay. I guess my sound is still in sync. Um, and so he went away happy, and I was safe. But if Japan had been a vengeful place after the, at that point, which was only 15 years after World War II and after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, I would have been a dead 15-year-old boy at that time. And uh, so that's what we need to keep in mind. Um, Human nature is human nature. Um, Grace says, I would say the reading speaks to that in tragically humbling way. Um, and uh, Aurora says, so if I understand the position of the light necessitates the position of the shadow and Yahweh is the totality of both the shadow and the light. Um, yeah, I, I think basically that's it. I'm not a theologian, so I'm not really going to speak about the nature of Yahweh, perhaps. Um, and uh, Christian Murti says uh, they were killed by a volcanic eruption, evaporated and dried to death instantly. I was not, I was not specific on how they died. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, and Aurora says, I did not mean that it reminded me of the book of Job in the semantics of the tragedy, but in the apparent meaninglessness and undeserved tragedy that results from an act of God. Um, and in other words, why does God punish those who are innocent and good? Uh, and grace is, which leads you back to Cain and Abel. <laughs> yes, and uh, Aurora says, I found Skip's video on Edinger's portable analytic app hour to be very helpful in this regard. I attempted to paste a link, but it requires approval first. Well, you can paste the link, and if I see it, I can approve it uh, if you say what it is. Um, and she then says, uh, this is really interesting. The dreamer appears to be f finally seeing her shadow side. This is not for approval, appears to me to be the shadow of the warrior archetype, the weak weakling seen as hubris. As a nation, we can say we stand for freedom, speaking as an American, but as we can see in Trump, there are latent shadow values which are also equally as valid. Uh, I would say, uh, Aurora, that uh, those shadow values are not necessarily equally as valid. I think that that's the ministry of the ego, and we have to say that. Um, and I'll be speaking more to that in a few minutes, but um, certainly Doc, uh, Donald Trump represents the shadow of American life. Um, and it must be recognized and integrated. That's definitely true. And uh, Grace says, judge not lest ye be judged. Absolutely. And um, so, and yet we must judge. I mean, we must make, um, we must in our ego sense uh, make a distinction between what is right and what is not right, what is good and what is bad. Um, and so uh, 
Gray says, uh, expanding their soul space. Hell yeah. Thank you for doing that with us, Skip. I hope that, I hope it helps in that way. Um, and Max says, thank you. I appreciate that. Grenade says, how does homosexuality and parenting relate to that idea? Uh, I'm confused. Okay, so I, I think I said it before, but let's be clear. The devil's trick is to have you arguing in your family over uh, whether homosexuality is right or wrong, whether it's uh, right for God or not right for God, blah, 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 you know, whatever the argument is, that's the devil's trick. And um, the fact is that you have a child that's homosexual and you, you have to find a way to uh, find the good as in, in terms that Dr. Uh, Ulanoff put it, uh, you have to find the good in your family and not destroy your family uh, because someone has to be, happens to be homosexual and you have these arguments. Um, you know, it so happens that um, I have a daughter with whom I totally disagree with on the topic of abortion and um, you know finally I simply took the position that I wasn't going to argue political issues like that with her I would I would still love her and I would be her father not not her debating counterpart and um, that seems to have worked out pretty well. And so, um, you know, you have to decide. I mean, obviously there are opportunities in a family to be very against one of your siblings, for example, and it happens in every family probably. Uh, and so, we need to step back from that and see where the good is and accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative type thing. Um, Aurora says, how could, I could be wrong, but I think it means that to fall into the trap of fighting over particular moral issues makes us lose sight of our inherent divine light, soul, or principle, God, yes. If you find yourself getting into a bickering fight with someone ruled by lower concepts, you bring yourself down to their level and lose sight of the guiding light and principle of the self. Grace says, I agree with that interpretation, as do I. And Malkuth says, it had to do with the philosophical differences between concepts of the unconscious. And Aurora says, I love that that da Vinci quote, me too. <laughs> Miles says, St. Paul said something like, shed light into darkness and the darkness itself becomes light. I think this aligns with Dr. Ulanoff more than Jung. Would you agree? Uh, and I'm going to say, um, I think Dr. Ulanoff, who's written for 40 years and 16 books by herself and six with her husband um, and who has served as the uh, professor of psychiatry and religion at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, I think that she aligns practically totally with Dr. Jung. And um, to the extent that she notes a difference in her perspective, um, I, which I found startling, as I said at the beginning of this, um, to the extent that she notes a difference in her perspective, uh, I respect that, but I think it's a distinction without a difference, uh, because um, I think, except for this, and that is that Dr. Jung was, in fact, stuck on the 
Logos side himself, even though all of his writing was very much about the Eros side, but he could not see, Dr. Jung could not see, and I'll, I'll just read you a paragraph that indicates that. He did not himself see why other psychologists and why theologians couldn't understand what his point was. And his point was, and I think Dr. Ulanoff definitely understands this and has written very widely about it, but um, his point is that we need both psychology and religion. We need to be able to uh, walk and chew gum at the same time because all religious traditions contain within them um, nuggets of pure gold and not only Christianity and um, and so um, but uh, there's a favorite paragraph of mine I, I'll take it from ion researches into the phenomenology of the self and this is paragraph 63 which sort of captures the essence of Dr. Jung himself being so close to what he was doing that he couldn't really get past what he had been doing. He, he had, through his whole life and career, he was trying to make acceptable to the scientific method the fountain. Okay, if we go back to the uh, da Vinci quote of uh, he who has access to the fountain does not go to the water jar. And so Dr. Jung was trying to always put what he was doing, which was heavily on the fountain side, um, was trying to put it into conceptual terms that other psychologists could accept and um, theologians could also accept. He wanted concepts that theologians could accept. And maybe there aren't those because as he rightly said in paragraph 752 of Answer to Job, every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. And so uh, the fact that virgins don't give birth in the physical world has no meaning whatsoever in the psychic world. Okay, In the psychic world, uh, the Virgin Mary is a psychic fact, and um, and so, but he could never get people to make that jump. And so, what Dr. Ulanoff apparently has been trying to do her whole career, and what I'm trying to do is to help people see that these um, that we need psychology and religion and that will help us understand quite a lot and but anyway he he grouses he often grouses about how other people don't understand him so let me quickly read um, paragraph 63 of ion the shadow the syzygy and the self are psychic factors of which an adequate picture can be formed only on the basis of a fairly thorough experience of them. Just as these concepts arose out of an experience of reality, so they can be elucidated only by further experience. Philosophical criticism will find everything to object to in them unless it begins by recognizing that they are concerned with facts and that the concept is simply an abbreviated description or definition of these facts. Such criticism is ha, such criticism has a little such criticism has as little effect on the object as zoological criticism on the duck billed platypus. It is not the concept that matters. The concept is only a word, a counter and it has meaning and use only because it stands for a certain sum of experience. Unfortunately, I cannot pass on this experience to my public. 
I've tried in a number of publications with the help of case material to present the nature of these experiences and also the method of obtaining them. Wherever my methods were really applied, the facts I give have been confirmed. One could see the moons of Jupiter even in Galileo's day if one took the trouble to use his telescope. So um, the point is concepts are concepts. The Logos is a lot of concepts, um, but you have to have an experience and you have to have an experience of God, uh, literally. And, um, and so if, you know, this is actually the basis of 12 step programs, as many of you may know, that um, if, if you don't have an experience of God, you're not going to be cured of alcoholism. And, um, and so, so he understands he, in this paragraph, he understands it, but then he's grousing that he can't, he doesn't have a way to get people to get it, how to get it. That's the question. Um, Okay, let's see. Um, and so, um, Thomas says, Leo Kotke said, sometimes darkness is the only light we see. Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be the case. Miles says, judge not lest you be judged, means don't judge the person, but address the fact and question the concepts rather than be critical of the human being. Well, I think maybe we're not quite that pure, <laughs> but it, it's an aspiration, surely. Uh, those who can't do teach, and uh, by the way, I'm not trying to teach here. I'm only presenting these ideas you you folks have to experience yourself and decide for yourself um, aurora says as nietzsche said there is a false saying how can someone who can't save himself save others supposing i have the key to our your chains why should you lock and my lock be the same even though Jung was stuck, it does not mean he, we cannot have the clarity to get past his shortcomings. Uh, he has given us so much, uh, but we are all human. Uh, you know, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm not even sure he would have recognized paragraph 63 as a as an example of his stuckness. Um, and so, yes, he's not perfect, but uh, he certainly opened up huge space. And that's what this whole YouTube channel and all the other interest in Jungian work that's now emerging on YouTube, uh, that's what it reflects, that there is this huge space that we need to open up in our psyches. And if we do that, then we can make judgments for ourselves. Um, and Thomas says, I am guessing that the syzygy Jung mentions is the self, the ego, and the shadow. Uh, I, I think here, uh, Thomas, he's referring to the anima and animus because this is in, um, I think this is uh, like in chapter three um, or chapter four. So in chapter three of Ion, he's talked about the syzygy as anima and animus. So in chapter four, which is the paragraph that this uh, paragraph 63 falls, he's talking about the syzygy. I think he means that. Um, the latter being cast by the self, the ego being the dark, solidity creating the shadow um, okay um, unfortunately I have to pull up that um, 
image. Let me see if I can find it quickly here again. Um, yeah. Okay, I don't have it handy to put onto the video, but I can show it to you. Uh, this is the image, and so doc, this is Dr. Edinger's interpretation, and he says, here's the self, here's the syzygy of the animus, animus, the ego, all the ego consciousness is up here, and under the ego is the shadow, and that's the structure that Dr. Edinger envisioned. Um, and uh, and, uh, and again, in terms of what the syzygy is, um, Dr. Edinger envisioned it as yoked together, and this was the image that he provides in, um, I'm showing you images from the Ion Lectures uh, by Edward Edinger. So that's what he had in mind, uh, not three things, but two. But anyway, uh, and it's something like uh, the yin-yang symbol, if you think of it that way. Miles says, St. Paul shed light into the darkness, and the darkness itself becomes light, means that light or good is superior to dark or evil. Um, yeah, I'm not going to dispute this question. I'm, I'm not an expert on St. Paul anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. I'm, unfortunately, I think that I my voice is out of sync. Yes, it is. Does my voice seem in sync to you? Um, that's what I need to ask because I seem to be losing sync from my point of view. Can any of you say whether my voice and uh, my clap and the sound of my clap is synchronized? If it is, I will endeavor to continue a little bit longer. If not, uh, I think I'll save what I was going to say for another time. In fact, I may do that anyway. Um, okay, so Aurora says it feels fine. All right, let me just go back to a few of these thoughts that I had. I'm not sure I actually put these all together, uh, but one of my thoughts was that in terms of housing the good and the evil, um, regardless of what political persuasion you have um, and which side you think is good and which is evil, um, the fact is that both of them fall into uh, our country, into the United States and into humanity at large. And, um, and so for Americans, uh, for our country, we have to ha house both within the same country. And the problem is that we can't, you know, the problem with evil and trying to divide us is that, um, uh, you know, we can't divide the country in a way that is, uh, that will make a perfect country. And the, the perfection of the United States is in its messiness, actually. And so for my fellow Americans, uh, when you go out the door after this reading and you go to the grocery store, you will find that we are pretty much living together pretty well. Okay, now if you watch cable news, you, you can find one terrible thing every day uh, because they're broadcasting a terrible thing here and a terrible thing there, and it makes it sound like this 
country is in chaos, but that's not the case at all. Uh, we do live together fairly well. We most 99.99% uh, .99 of us uh, pretty much uh, behave and follow the law and, um, and or let, let's say, I'll correct that. Since we have 6 million people in prison, uh, let me say that 98% of us follow the law. And, um, and that's leaving aside what should be the law and what should not be the law. But 98% um, of us do not live in prisons. And so regardless of whether we're good or evil, we're, we are contained within that. And that's Dr. Olinoff's point, I think. Um, and um, and so um, so my point is that um, what we see is that um, the U.S. system of debate, vigorous debate and um, debate that often engenders some uh, vengeful or hateful attitudes, it certainly does, but the reality is over 400 years now, um, we have been debating back and forth. Uh, one time it led to violence in the U.S. Civil War, but mostly it has not, or not to that magnitude. I mean, I'm not saying there's no violence, obviously there is, but for example, for all the fear and trembling about guns, we have 350 million guns in the United States and, you know, we're, we're not having firefights all over the place. And sometimes we do have firefights when someone who is deranged goes out and decides they want to kill someone, and obviously that's evil. But, you know, you'd, you'd think from the, from the rhetoric that, you know, we have chaos and we, we have shootings on every street corner, and we don't. And, and so, um, so the reality is that our debate... Um, clears the air and allows us to um, correct things. And um, the, um, well, I think that the golden thing, and I, I spent 15 years going around the world as a sidelight. I asked everybody I knew and many foreign people, uh, what one thing about, above all else um, makes the United States the strongest country in the world today, what makes it the one country of the world that every nationality, every religion, every ethnic um, origin wants to come to, okay? So the, the United States is a, is a magnet. Why is that? And, and um, the answer is that our system has created a very strong country and it's it's a process like tempering steel we bang into each other it's bumper cars um, but as we do that we uh, knock the impurities out and so we're blessed by having ideas from every group from every race from every religion for from every uh, country of the world and we have ideas that come up from all of those people and every good idea we all adopt and every bad idea we pound out of the system one way or another. And that isn't to say that it's ever going to be perfect as we uh, see in our politics today. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, you know, for those of you who think that Donald Trump might be a, become a tyrant, um, you can put those fears aside because uh, as Gandhi put it, 
um, you know, um, there have been tyrants in the world, and for a time they can seem very strong, but in the end they always fall. Think of it, always. And that's absolutely true. Okay, so Malkuth says that Stephen Pinker's perspective, but one would wish to include all the wars we're prosecuting around the world. What would be the denial of this? Who's denying it? I'm not denying it. Uh, I think the issue stems from ideology. Guns like fire and anything else are tools. Uh, Prometheus stole the fire from the gods and gave it to the people. This act is inherently neutral as the, the way fire is used is up to the people and their motivations. War isn't inherently evil, but there is difference between just action and violence for ulterior purposes. Um, and I would agree with that. Absolutely. Okay. We, um, whatever people come up with as methods of getting things done, uh, it's only historically in history books that we can show what is good and what is evil. Um, okay, so... Um, I'm going to hold off on my, my personal observations on this, except to um, talk about Iraq a little bit and, um, and how we got to the point we've gotten to. Um, obviously, there were some people in the Middle East who uh, thought that the U.S. was bad. Um, they attacked the United States on 9-11, um, and obviously that calls forth a, um, a vengeful response. And so, you know, the United States started two wars as a result of that. Um, it has now killed millions of people. Most of them have been Muslims. And, um, you know, the question is, how do we stop it? Um, now, I do see that I'm really getting out of sync now. Um, so... So, Aurora says, war isn't inherently evil. Okay. She mm -hmm. says, uh, Donald Trump is the archetypal weakling. His hubris shows his inherent insecurity. The weakling is the shadow of the warrior, the heart-centered fighter. Um, and I would say that that is definitely true. And I, I have uh, friends who are very senior psychologists in the state, in my state, and they basically say that the issue for with Donald Trump is that he has a very teeny weeny little ego, and so he protects it with this bluster. And as my father taught me when I was in the fourth grade, the hard boiled egg always is yellow inside, and that has always proved to be true in my lifetime. Miles says, Lieutenant Colonel Smedley Butler tells us there are two sides to a coin, including the military. There are even two sides to the Marshall Plan, not all sweetness and goodness, according to some political scientists. Um, yes, both true. And, um, you know, Smedley Butler um, became a general. Not a, he wasn't a lieutenant colonel, he was lieutenant general. And um, he um, rejected a plan by certain uh, industrialists in the U.S. to um, 
lead a coup d'etat, uh, literally a coup d'etat. And um, he refused to do it and blew the whistle on it, and the result was that it failed. And uh, another part of the result there was that uh, Smedley Butler had a, a um, major U.S. Marine Corps base named after him uh, as a result of his uh, loyalty to the Constitution of the United States. And uh, he's one of the heroes of the Marine Corps. And uh, I, I acknowledge to you, Miles, that not everything about the Marshall Plan was good, uh, but it was, whatever it was, it was certainly better than the Treaty of Versailles. And Economov says, um, Gandhi forced young girls to sleep in bed with him, be cautious with this, his figure. Um, there, is, uh, there is apparently truth to that story, and uh, that did not have to do necessarily uh, with any ill motive, although some people have suggested that. Um, mind you, in India, in the time that he was living, um, things were pretty rough. They still are rough for many people, and especially many people who were uh, living uh, in the way that he was living. And uh, I know from sleeping close to my wife uh, for many years, um, I can stay warm and therefore healthy by doing that. And, um, you know, Gandhi also swore off sex um, very early in his life, which um, his uh, wife did not necessarily agree with, but nonetheless, he did that. So I don't think we can attribute either good or evil to um, those things, uh, you know, we, we have um, a flawed man in history, and we are all flawed men or women in history. We have a flawed man in history who caused a major change in the way the world worked, and that was in the form of um, liberating India from the British Raj. And um, there, uh, you know, was he perfect? No, he wasn't. Uh, neither, were, neither has anyone else ever been. Um, and um, um, says, kernels of truth can come from people who could be considered evil. Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's, there are certain truths about um, the things that Donald Trump has done. And, um, you know, although I would prefer that he were not our president, on the other hand, um, I actually prefer him to, to Pence because uh, Pence wants to cram his version of the Christian religion uh, down our throats. And, um, you know, that's not acceptable to me either. <laughs> so, anyway, um, and Rora says, I'm sure Osho said lots of deeply true things, but Osho inherently wasn't 100% saintly. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. And uh, we know many, uh, many religious figures in every religion who have uh, failed along these lines and um, and we all have to, and Dr. Young's point is that in the end we all have to make our own decisions and this is Dr. Uh, Ulanoff's going back to our origins here uh, this is what Dr. Ulanoff was talking about the ministry of the ego uh, let me just see if she says it in a succinct way.
Okay, let me just read the very first paragraph of this book. So I'm reading from the Wisdom of the Psyche, and I'm reading the first paragraph of the first chapter, and the chapter is called The Ministry of the Ego, and she says, we are accustomed in the Judeo we are accustomed in the Judeo Christian tradition to believe that we should renounce the ego, sacrifice it, forsake it. And I would add that's also true in Buddhism. Uh, anything less is thought to be selfish, if not downright evil. What nonsense then, or worse, what blasphemy, to begin this book with the topic the ministry of the ego. I do so because of the precise ministry assigned to the ego to house what we have been given to be and to give it back to the giver. And by the giver, she's referring to God, of course. So anyway. Um, So Aurora says, oh yes, in some ways I'm very thankful for Donald Trump as he's bringing all these issues to the surface to be dealt with. And there are many. Um, and obviously it is true that the powers to be in our financial community and our industrial community did export all those jobs to China. They did. They exported them. And um, by the way, I, I was a part of that. And, um, and I acknowledged that I was a part of it. Uh, and so the question, is, and so when election 2016 came around and people in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, voted against Hillary Clinton, I understand why they were mad, I do. Um, and, um, and I don't think it was well done, okay? And I think there are a lot of things in the way our economy works that do not serve the average American very well. And those are issues that I haven't taken up as yet and will do at some point. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking about doing it on a different channel though, on my political psychology channel. And Miles says that we don't live in Saudi Arabia or China and therefore can have these exchanges must never be taken for granted, hoping that we never have a social credits count. Yeah. And, um, as apparently China is getting. I'm not quite, I don't know what you mean by that exactly, but, you know, obviously uh, China is not, cannot be considered a free country. And, um, and they have certainly over the last 40 years since Nixon went to China, um, they have certainly taken advantage of the United States and the American people and um, you know notwithstanding the fact that they hold a great am amount of our debt uh, nonetheless the reality is that um, it's little green electrons okay that's it's not substantive and so they may have a problem with that and uh, Thomas says, yet the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world, surpassing the Saudis in China. And I agree with that entirely. And I think that we have a problem in having for-profit prisons because it means the people that are uh, lobbying and paying our politicians are uh, have created it as a business and therefore... They want to, what they have created is a new kind of slavery, actually, because they're uh, using that labor that's in prison at a very, very low rate, uh, pay rate, uh, in order to save a lot of money. And I, I think that's a big problem with our 
prison system today. And uh, now Kusos China was, has created three or four of the richest people in the world through the support of Walmart. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's both good and evil there. I mean, when I was a young first lieutenant in the Marine Corps, um, I went to Chinese language school. And the reason I did was because we were preparing to be at war with the People's Republic of China. And, um, and so the opening up of China had uh, certainly its good points, which made for the fact that, um, that we never went to war with China after Korea and or not or except for the proxy war in Vietnam, but that's a different issue. <laughs> so, um, but the good thing of opening up China was that we prevented a catastrophic global war between the United States and China, uh, and it has also cost us, um, certainly. And, um, you know, these, these battles go back and forth constantly in our society, um, and they don't, they never will be finally resolved. But this is Dr. Ulanoff's point that, um, you know, there's never going to be perfection and goodness is messy and it's not perfect and um and going for perfection is causing evil actually because by forcing trying to force perfection we do things that are that become evil in other ways um it's a Aurora says, we have an inherent bias, perhaps it came from the Puritans against rehabilitation, a sort of fetishization of punishment. We can see this in the death penalty and how our laws are structured. Uh, we make it incredibly difficult for prisoners to get out and live a successful life afterwards permanently re ruining their lives and reinforcing the prison system. Yep, and um, hopefully the new statute that is coming out of the, the Trump administration will improve that, apparently, because uh, Jared Kushner's father had to serve in prison, and he may be hoping to make a, a better place for himself to be later on, who knows. Miles says, Nixon was actually a good president in many ways, opening China and the EPA. Surprised to hear me thinking this. Uh, I agree with you, actually. And Thomas says, I wish I could feel more confident that the light in the world would, given enough time, went out to overwhelm the dark elements. Spiritual entropy, second law of thermodynamics at work possible. Um, no, <laughs> it's not possible. Um, the light is not ever going to win out because the light is the opposite of the dark. And, uh, and so what Dr. Olinoff, one of the points that she makes here is that if you try to get perfection, if you try to get one side to win out over the other, uh, you just make things worse. And um, so, you know, let, let's take the abortion debate. Um, regardless of what happens, no babies are going to be saved. Um, and those of us who remember the 60s and earlier, know that many, many babies died, even though um, abortion was denied. And what, but what it did, uh, denying abortion, was that it made about 15% of our medical community uh, felons. And it 
brutalized our society, as you can see if you ever go back and look at the movies in the heat of the night or Dirty Dancing, the original versions of those movies, you'll see how it brutalized our society when uh, abortion was forbidden. And so abortion is not about saving babies. It's about having a talking point that people who are not well versed in the facts um, might believe. And uh, I have a daughter who uh, you know, is against abortion because, oh my God, it's going to kill babies. Well, there are going to be babies killed one way or the, another. And the way they were aborted in the past was truly horrific. And, um, and it cost a lot of women their lives. And, but the fact is that with abortion or without abortion, no babies are going to be saved. And we have to understand that that issue is being used to manipulate the American people. That's all. Um, and so Aurora says, the light needs the dark. It's a spectrum like the hot creates the cold by its existence. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we have been at it here for uh, over two hours. I need to bring this to a halt, um, but I'll just mention again that I've been reading from The Wisdom of the Psyche by Ann Belford of Ulanoff, and also, there's my other one, um, The Living God and Our Living Psyche, uh, What Christians Can Learn from Carl Jung, and I, I, would, exp I would amplify that and say what all followers of all faiths can learn from Carl Jung because as Dr. Edinger said and you can find um, highlighted in the Edinger line on the front page of this YouTube channel, um, Dr. Jung found the source of all religions and he spoke to the source of all religions and he provided the basis, basically, for world peace among religions. And uh, that's a pretty broad statement, but it, I urge you to go take a look at uh, that video, and I'll give you the name of it, but you, you can also find a link to it on the front page, which is uh, Edward uh, Edinger and American... Uh, Jungian, 1994, I believe. So if you go find that, um, why didn't that go on? I don't know. Somehow I have not allowed my own <laughs> my own thing, but it's Edward Edinger and American Union. So anyway, I'm now going to. Uh, Let's see. Let me try it again. Edward. Okay, I still didn't take it. So um, just look at the front page of this YouTube channel and look for the playlists about Edward Edinger. You'll find it there. Okay, I'm going to terminate for now, and I will see you uh, perhaps tomorrow. Tomorrow in our reading group, we will be meeting at Sammy's Pizza Kitchen. So um, uh, we will... Um, uh, I'll have to check that out. I don't know why that would be the case. Oh, the guy who uploaded it deleted his account. Uh, hmm. Well, um, the interesting thing is that I did make a transcript of that uh, lecture. So um, let's see. I will. Let's see here. Maybe I can find it quickly.
that's a shame that that would have happened. Uh, but let me see if I can get it quickly here from my own website. Um, and um, what I what I did was I created a, a, a transcript uh, of that video exactly for that reason because I was afraid it might disappear. Um, and so let's see. Okay, so you may not be able to see, um, you may not be able to see the video, but you can definitely see this transcript, uh, which is on my website. Hmm, for some reason that is not allowing, uh, but let me tell you how to find it. It's not allowing even me to put, um, links on the chat and so um, I'll tell you how you can find it though you go to archetypeinaction.com and click on any article there uh, and that will put you on a second page and on that second page on the right column you will find a tab for Edinger and in that tab you will find a video called uh, Edward Edinger's summation of Jungian psychology. And uh, so I would take a look at that. That's a, a transcript of that particular video we've been discussing. Ah, and uh, God knows why all that's happening, but I'll check it out and let you know. So anyway, tomorrow uh, I will be at Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen at 8 p.m. Uh, talking to